What's going on, guys? Welcome back to The Control Room. I'm your host, Israel Johannes. Now, today's a very special episode. I have a guest that I've been wanting to have on. His name is Dave Evans. He was my professor of sports broadcasting at Baylor University, and he was the former coordinating producer of Fox slash Valley Sports Southwest, New Orleans, and Oklahoma. And even before then, he was with the Dallas Mavericks. We go into his entire career, starting at KWTX up to the Dallas Mavericks, and then to the to the regional sports network, and talk about you know, the change in technology, the change in basketball, and as well as some life advice. So lots of good things to look forward to in this episode. Stick around for the whole thing. Before we get there, though, I do want to mention that because this is episode 21 of The Control Room, we've now reached the top 1% of podcasts everywhere. So out of all the podcasts that exist, there's about 10% that make it past episode 3, which is kind of a low bar. However, out of the last 10%, only 10% of those get to episode 21 and beyond, which is why it goes down to 1% in totality. So that all to say is that that's just another milestone to check off. This is only the beginning. We're still, we still got plenty more to go. Now, let's check out a quick recap of the Mavs, Pelicans, and Thunder before we get to the interview. The Mavericks are 13-2 and two in their last 15 games and are sitting in fifth in the West. The Pelicans have lost four in a row, and they did not have Zion or Brandon Ingram against the Spurs, so they're finding themselves in a little bit of trouble. And the Thunder have now experienced their first three-game losing streak of the season and currently don't have Shea Gilgis-Alexander. Not sure on the status of Jalen Williams, J-Dub. First off, Dallas in the clutch. That's probably the biggest stat to look at right now. They've won 13 of their last 15 total games, regardless of clutch situation. Their only losses were to Oklahoma City without Luka and the Golden State game in the Bay Area. Their clutch wins, they're 5 and 1 in their last 6 clutch games, and their 22 and 9 clutch record this season is second best in the NBA behind the Lakers 23-9, and nine, and today they do play the Cleveland Cavaliers. The 22-9 and nine clutch record this season is still tied for the third best clutch record through 31 games in franchise history with none other than the title-winning season of 2010 and 2011. So that has been consistent all the way through. It, the clutch, their efficiency, is now first in the NBA in offensive rating at a 124.9 rating. That is absurd because they hadn't led in that. I don't think they've led in that category all season, but now here they are topping Oklahoma City. On the defensive side of the ball, they have a defensive rating of 105.2, which is eighth in the NBA, and their net rating is 19.7, giving them a third place ranking in the NBA. So they've, they're they now a top, they're a top offense in the clutch, top 10 defense in the clutch, top five team, top three team overall in the clutch. So they found ways to execute. Although that Golden State game that they did lose, I did find that four minutes straight they did not execute in the clutch. Those were an anomaly, and they seem to have found their way back in the groove. Now, moving on to the Pelicans, they seem to be free-falling because they've la- they've lost four straight. Brandon Ingram is still out with that knee injury. Zion was out with a finger. Jose Alvarado did not play against the Spurs. And that was due to an oblique injury. Then Najee Marshall was actually in the game against the Spurs and then hurt his shoulder and he did not return in that game, according to Aaron Summers of Bally Sports New Orleans. The good news, though, for the Pelicans, Dyson Daniels has played in the Pelicans' last four games. And considering he was coming back from a meniscus surgery, the fact that he's on the floor and getting his minutes up, they they have... The trajectory of his minutes have gone up. Most recently, that Spurs game, he played 37 minutes, so it's good to see him get his legs underneath him. They also have a chance, the Pelicans do, to make up ground on the number six seed Sunday at Phoenix because Phoenix is the team ahead of them in the standings, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Now let's quickly look at the Thunder. They're in unfamiliar territory. This is the only three-game losing streak they've had all season long, 
Coach Mark Dagnall has said that Shea Gilders Alexander will miss the rest of the road trip. All they have left is Sunday's game at Charlotte. And then J-Dub was out with an ankle injury, although no word yet on his status for Sunday's game at Charlotte. But the Thunder offense, if it can't roll through Chet, if it can't go through Chet and Josh Giddy's not the one who's making sure that the ball doesn't get turned over and he's facilitating the offense in a way that he did in seasons past, without J-Dub and without Shea, obviously, the Thunder are in a bit of a pickle because that is those two guys really run the prim, the primary roles of that offense. So without them, the Thunder might find themselves stuck in the three spot, which might not be a bad thing depending on who they get as the number six seed. So speaking of seeds, let's look at the Western Conference standings. Minnesota is currently leading the way at number one with a 53 and 24 record tied with Denver. Oklahoma City sitting one game back, and then you have the next tier with the LA Clippers at 49 and 28, four games back at the top spot. Dallas is behind the Clippers by two games, sitting 47 and 30 through 77 games. Phoenix is only one game behind Dallas. However, Dallas has the tiebreaker over Phoenix, so Phoenix would need to not only have a, they would just need to have a better record than Dallas, but that would require two wins. So. That might not happen for the for the Suns as easily it could as it could happen for the Mavericks. Then you look in the play-in window, and you have the Pelicans at 45 and 32. They could still get a 50-win season, but they have to win out. They're eight games back, and because they're only one game back of Phoenix, right? This does play into the tiebreaker situation that they uh they could win head to head or or at least get a head-to-head win. That will only help their case when it comes to looking at if they were to end with the same record. But for the Pelicans, of course, they want to escape it entirely, so try not to fall on tiebreakers for this. If they beat the Suns on Sunday, then both teams would end up having a 46-32 and 32 record, and then from that point on, it's a matter of just keeping your head in the game and trying to win as many games as you can so that you don't have to deal with tiebreakers by the end of the season. Behind the Pelicans, you've got the Sacramento Kings, the Los Angeles Lakers, and the Golden State Warriors all vying for play-in spots. As of right now, Houston is in the 11th spot and four games back of Golden State. So mathematically, they have not been eliminated, but the Kings and the Lakers have already clinched, quote-unquote, play-in berths. Not necessarily play-in berths as in they're locked in the play-in, but they have a they have a postseason berth. So they're either making the playoffs or they're going to make the play-in. They will not be eliminated from contention. So the only spot left for the Rockets is Golden State, who's going to have to play the New Orleans Pelicans. So there's lots of things for these teams in order to that they have to watch out for, especially because they're they're dealing with hungry teams. Speaking of hungry teams, the Pelicans have to close their season out against the Lakers, so it's not going to be an easy ride for any of these teams. The Thunder at least have a four-game home stretch, but it ends with a matchup against Dallas, and we know how that happened when both teams were fully healthy. So, that is the recap of the Western Conference and Dallas, New Orleans, and Oklahoma City. At least just a quick recap before we get into this interview. Now, the time has come. Here's the first interview of the control room with none other than Dave Evans. Enjoy. All right, guys, this is the first interview for the control room. I'm very excited to bring on this guest. This person is the one that got me into sports broadcasting through his class at Baylor University, our alma mater. I want to bring in Dave Evans, my professor of sports broadcasting. Dave, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Ezreal. How are you doing today? I'm great. Uh, it, it's it's great to have you on. It feels really surreal considering uh, I took your class in 2018, and and now here we are. It's like and here we are. A lot lots of things have lots of things have happened in the last six years. So uh, definitely, it's it's really good to have you on. Thanks. It's great to be here. So the uh, the first thing I want to ask you is, 
let's go all the way back to when it when you first started in this industry. Um, mm-hmm. Sports broadcasting has changed over the years and the decades. And uh, for those who are my age who may not know how it was done in the past, you have a good view as to how it's evolved, especially as the age of technology has grown over time. So when you were first starting at Baylor and then as you graduated and moved into your first job, um, how did how did the industry look? Well, uh, the you know, when you talk about technology is really the biggest change. And when you talk about technology changes, you're talking about, you know, you can have uh, macro changes and then a lot of micro changes underneath that. But the big macro changes uh, were really the move from analog to digital um, and then the move from standard definition to uh, HD. And um, and those were probably the biggest major shifts uh, that, that we were seeing. Um, everything was linear editing when I got into the business. So it was tape to tape and you actually had physical videotape that you were editing with. Now everything's on Avid's or it's on, you know, Final Cut Pro or whatever and it's and it's a digital based system. One of the things that I used to do early in my career was I, I edited commercials and you would have clients come in and they would come in and you're editing tape to tape and you're doing this this commercial for them and then they would say hey can you move this middle part out of the commercial i want that out of there and, and i'm like okay yeah we can do that we're going we're going to have to kind of start over and 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 i tried to explain to them that linear editing is like making a chocolate chip cookies and then trying to take the flour out you know and so uh, <laughs> now with with um digital based editing you know you can do that and um so anyway, uh, the, the shifts in technology have been the biggest ones. And then, you know, since I've been in the industry for quite a while, the shifts that are going on right now, which, you, you know, I may be getting ahead of myself, are really from um, kind of a um, linear based transmission uh, model through fiber optics and things like that and satellite to uh, IP based um, workflows. And so... Um, it's just the big techni- technology shifts are, are the, the main thing that, that I think of that changed between the time I got out of college to where we are now. Yeah, the linear to nonlinear, I'm sure every ed- editor now is thankful for the programs we have. And especially with the requests that go out all the time, like we need a package right. of this put together and all the clips that they got to put in. Um, it, it's Most editors quite now parallel don't with. Know. I was going to say most editors now don't even know what to be thankful for <laughs> because <laughs> linear editing was all already there when they started. I'm really old, Ezreal, so <laughs> it was it was way back uh, way back when 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 I was doing tape to tape. So <laughs> the transition from linear to nonlinear editing, Hollywood seems to have also had that transition. Um, and so, the, did you find that it was around the same time that not only Hollywood went from the traditional system to what it is today that television and broadcasting also moved at the same time or did they run on different timelines? You know, that's a, that's an interesting question that I honestly don't fully remember what the answer to that is. Um, because I was so ingrained in broadcast television. I knew when it happened in broadcast television, which was, which was right around 1996, 97. Uh, is when that shift was really starting to take hold. Um, and then it, it fully, I think, came to fruition, you know, somewhere around 2000. But um, I, I want to say that that broadcast was a little bit in front of it, and then Hollywood caught up about three to five years later. But um, that's an anecdotal assessment. I'm not completely sure if I'm accurate on that. That's all good. Uh, eventually, they both got on, so that's That's exactly part. right. Yes. Uh, your uh, your first job out of college, actually first, I want to ask about your graduating class. There have been a couple of people that you've mentioned to us when we were students, people you've graduated with that are somewhat high profile in the industry. Who are some of the people that came out of Baylor and really out of college around your time? Okay. Well, the, the, the one most notable that I think of, and, and interestingly enough, he is not on the air at ESPN anymore, but he was a very visible part of ESPN's on talent um, 
um, you know, um, personnel, and that was Trey Wingo. Um, Trey uh, was on ESPN doing NFL Live. Um, before that, he had done Sports Center and and a lot of things. Um, he's no longer at ESPN. He's 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 doing some other things now. But um, but he's he's one of the most notable ones that that I remember. And I think your class back in that time knew who he was. And and uh, I remember the very first class. Uh, Trey joined us for, uh, this was back in 2016, Trey joined us as a guest speaker um, online, and uh, I had like two people in the class that were just in awe. They were fanboying because they, <laughs> they you know, followed him, you know, uh, when he was at ESPN. So, so that's one very notable uh, person to come out of Baylor. And, and we've had several, I mean, there's been, there's been a handful of people. There's a guy that wasn't a guest speaker, um, for your group. And, um, I'm just now kind of starting to bring him on because I just realized where he is now, but there was a guy named Larry Holm who, um, was in college roughly the same time that I was at Baylor, uh, that I'd gotten to know. And, uh, he's now an executive at the golf channel. So, you know, he's there, oh, wow. you know, kind of doing, doing that. Um, you know, we've had, golly, I know I'm forgetting some people because there's, there's a smattering of them out there. And I bring a lot of, uh, guest speakers from Baylor, um, back. The chief strategy officer at the Dallas Mavericks is a Baylor graduate and he gets involved in a lot of the broadcast, um, you know, um, planning, uh, for the Mavericks. Um, and so, uh, he's a Baylor graduate, you know, there's, there's quite a few of us here, here in the industry. Uh, that have made their way into sports broadcast television. Most people more recognize some of the Baylor grads that have gone into the film industry. The guys that are producing Chicago Fire, you know, Derek Haas and, and some of those guys that are uh, part of, you know, Chicago Fire and uh, Chicago PD, those shows. And and um, I can't remember who the, the Baylor graduate was that did the uh, screenplay for Saving um, Mr. Banks. Uh, but, you know, how, you know, Baylor is well represented both in the sports broadcast world, the broadcast world and and Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had we did have a guest, the uh, producer for Hacksaw Ridge. Uh, he yep. came by and we, we did a screening around the time that it was in consideration for awards and all that. And, uh, and, right. and back to Trey, back to Trey Wingo, I grew, basically grew up watching him on NFL right. Live. It was around the time I was in high school. So it was when yeah. I was heavily focused on watching, like if I were watching sports, I'd want to get more detail and go to him. And I think outside of the, the panel that they have currently, Trey's was one of my favorite panels of all time on that show, at least from my recent memory. Uh, so it, it was, it, it was kind of surreal finding out that you guys were together at one point and then have both found your own paths in the industry. And where I want to get to next is the, um, the first job that you had out of Baylor. You were at the local Waco affiliate and spent mm -hmm. some time there, brought up your skills before you eventually moved into sports. So how, how, was, how was that job and what did it teach you? Where, what were things that you knew going in that you didn't know? And what skills did you find that translated from that type of broadcasting to the one that you eventually built your the rest of your career on. Okay, so man, I may be talking for a little while here because there's there's a lot uh, to pack into this answer. But um, when uh, so I cut my teeth in the business. I cut my teeth in the business at the um, CBS affiliate KWTX there in Waco, and. Um, you asked kind of what I learned that I didn't know. Um, I, I learned humility. Um, I learned that, um, you know, I already knew that starting out, you're not going to make a ton of money, but I had no idea that I was going to go to college for four years and that my first big break in television out of college was going to be a minimum wage job sweeping floors, running a camera, occasionally stage managing, and um, running an audio board for a master control shift. I mean, we, we did, you know, kind of multiple things. But, you know, I, um, 
that first job, I was working probably 60 hours a, a, a week. And uh, thank goodness I got those hours because the per hour rate wasn't very much. Minimum wage at that time was, um, I think, 375 or something like that. So, oh, man. <laughs> um, you know, so, um, so it, was, it was a very humbling experience, but it, it taught me a lot. It taught me, um, it taught me a lot about the human nature of, of just people <laughs> and, and, and how they go about um, their business and, and, and how to conduct myself uh, and and really use that experience to build a future because I had coworkers at that at that experience, and these coworkers would um, look at how much they were making, which wasn't very much, and they would uh, they would get angry and frustrated, and they would say, "We need to start a union or something like that." And I would laugh at them and say, "You can start a union if you want to, but there's a line of of Baylor kids waiting to come in and take your position." So, you know, that, that's not going to happen. And, um, their attitude was, I can, I can make more money flipping burgers at McDonald's. And they kept saying stuff like that. And finally, I just looked at one of them and I said, then please leave and go flip burgers at McDonald's because (laughs) griping about it isn't helping anything. And it's not doing anything. So the way I looked at it at that point in time is I looked around me and the one thing KWTX had was a lot of good equipment. And so I basically said, I'm going to learn as much as I can while I'm here. I'm going to learn how the tape machines work. I'm going to learn to edit uh, on their system. Um, I'd done tape to tape editing in college, but, you know, this was uh, we had we had made the progression from three quarter inch tape in college to beta cam tape in um in uh, the professional broadcast world uh, of 1986. So we are, um, I'm learning that. I, and then I learned how to be a technical director. And I learned how to direct newscasts. And so in a very quick time frame, I started, you know, directing broadcasts. After I'd been hired to sweep floors, run a camera, run a teleprompter, and you know, run an audio board for a master control. Um, so the thing that was kind of nice about it was being able to learn, be in an environment where I could get my hands on equipment and learn it. And in doing that, I built just a bunch of experiences that cobbled themselves together in, in, in such a way that it really prepared me for my big break that came later in 1997. Uh, but I want to talk about some of those specific experiences. I um, came to the station. I've already kind of told you what I was doing. I learned to direct, and so I was directing newscasts. Eventually, um, oh, one part of the story I didn't tell was I'd, I'd also been uh, tapped to do weather on the weekends. So I was a weathercaster on the weekends and a director during the week. In fact, <laughs> wait, I may be wait, the only before guy. You, before you Go before ahead. you move on, um, how do don't you don't you have to be a meteorologist, like an actual meteorologist, to be the weatherman? Or did they was there someone that actually that did all the data sides for you? There was someone that did the data side for us. Um, our head okay. weather guy actually did not have a degree in meteorology, so it's not oh. a requirement. It's not a requirement, wow. but he knew enough about it to teach me what okay. I needed to know. And I didn't want to be a weatherman, but the job opened up and my college roommate, who was one of the sports guys at the station, which is what I wanted to do. He said, I would, I would go after it because it'll hone your on-air skills. So I was like, okay, let, let's give this a shot. And so they saw my tape. They felt like they had something they could work with there. And so they sent me through like a three month crash course in meteorology and just night after night in between the six o'clock news and the 10 o'clock news, it was me rehearsing. So I would, I would do the six o'clock news. I would rehearse weather and then I'd go back and work the 10 o'clock news and, uh, in production. And so, you know, you're doing all of this stuff. And so, um, but we, we, we got to a point to where I was doing weather on weekends. I was directing during the week they ultimately wanted to promote me in the production department to be the creative services director. And so they said, you've got to make a choice now. 
if you stay with the weather, we're going to assign you as a news reporter in the news department during the week. And, and that'll be, you know, where we put you. Or you can stop doing the weather and do the creative services position. Well, by that time, I had fallen in love with the producing side of the business. I'd had the opportunity to produce the, the uh, Baylor men's football coaches show, uh, women's basketball coaches show. I mean, there was, there was marketing videos that we were making for the athletic department, things like that. And so I was, I was getting in on the producing side of sports, and I was really falling in love with that. So um, I decided to stay with the production route. And what happened there is um, pretty soon our production manager left. They advanced me to be the production manager of the station. And uh, in being the production manager, I was running a department of 25 people. I was running um, a very sizable production facility. And uh, I was uh, managing, did I say I was managing a staff of 25 people? Um, And, you know, I'd already done a lot of this sports production. So all of those experiences were playing themselves perfectly for what was going to be my next big break. One of the other things that we did was before I became the production manager, our production manager at the time decided to make our production department a revenue generator, which production departments at TV stations are not generally revenue generators. They're generally cost centers. But we had a lot of industry in Waco and in Central Texas, and so this is before corporate video was a thing in in most corporations. Most corporations have their own internal video departments now but they didn't have that back then. So we went out and we called on companies and said, hey, do you need a training video made? Or do you need a marketing video made? Or do you need this made? So we started selling and making corporate video. And so I was very involved in that as well. And, and I'm bringing that up because it was, it was a very integral part of uh, what my next step was, was going to be um, as, I, as I got into the next, next big break. So do you want me to go ahead and talk about that? Yes, yes, please do. Okay. So nine years at KWTX, I had a brief stint at another uh, small production house, and uh, going to that production house was actually the impetus um, of my career. It was the changing point of my career because I was miserable in that job. I hated it. And if I didn't hate it so much, I never would have sat down with my wife one night and said, I'm not happy in my job. I think I want to go out and start my own business. Whether it's in production or something else, but I really was entrepreneurial and I thought that's what I wanted to do. Ezreal, I was so ill-prepared to do that. I was so naive. (laughs) But I didn't know what I didn't know. My wife knew (laughs) And she, you know, she kind of likes a steady paycheck and insurance and those kinds of things. So my wife um, sat me down one night and she said, okay, before you go start your own business, would you at least update your resume and send it to your dream jobs? Send it to the places you most would want to work up in the Dallas area, because Dallas was kind of like a home away from home, all of my extended family, both my parents were from North Texas. So, so that's what I did. I I took her advice. And uh, I sent resumes to every team, sports franchise, production house, TV station, regional network, whatever. I sent resumes to just about everywhere I could think of. And I got a lot of, you know, no responses. We don't have anything. I got a lot of good responses that was just, we don't have anything. You're qualified, but we don't have anything. So about six weeks had passed and we had decided, okay, nothing's going to come of that. So my wife and I were sitting down again one night and she said, okay, I don't think anything's going to come from the resumes that you sent. Thank you for sending them, but I want you to be happy. So I'm going to get out of your way. And if you need to start your own company, you go ahead and do that. Mind you, she had been really wanting to, by this time we had had our first child, and she was really wanting to leave her teaching job and be a stay-at-home mom. Well, at this point, she's going to have to take a second job because I'm not going to be making any money starting my own company to start with. So uh, it was a huge sacrifice on her part. 
Well, the very next morning, after talking to my wife about that, my phone rang at my at my office at that time, and it was a guy from the Dallas Mavericks. And he said, hey, I've got your resume sitting here. Um, I'd like to see if you'd like to come in for an interview. It's like, of course, you know. And so, And so that was really the turning point. Long story short, I got a second interview. I got the job. And, and one of the things I remember asking him, as I said, I'm in the interview and I said, okay, this isn't just a position at a high profile organization. This is a high profile position at a high profile organization. So why are you talking to me? Because I know you have people in your sphere of influence who want this job that you already know. So why me? Why, why are you, why did, did you, what, what about me made you want to talk to me? And, and he looked down at my resume and he goes, oh, that's easy. He goes, you got the only four things on my resume that are the four things that I'm completely looking for. You're the only one that has all four of them. And here's what those four things were. First, he wanted someone who had managed a department. And I'd managed, becoming the production manager at the station, I'd managed a department of like 25 people. And then he said, I need someone who's run a production facility because here at Reunion Arena at the time, we have Reunion Production Company. And part of your job is going to be to run Reunion Production Company. So I need someone who's, who knows how to do that. He said, and then I need someone who's produced some sports programming. Well, I'd done those coaches shows, the marketing videos. I'd even had a chance to do a, a little bit of remote sports. Uh, and then I had the sports casting stuff that I'd done at Baylor and a little bit out of college, on-air stuff. So all of that kind of came together. The fourth one was the kicker. He said, and it says here that you've done corporate video. I'm looking for someone with a little corporate video experience. Now I'm like going... <laughs> what? <laughs> this is a sports organization. <laughs> what are we talking about corporate video for? And he said, well, you know, in the off season, um, reunion production company is kind of quiet and I'd like to bring in some corporate clients just to get a little revenue in and keep, keep the, uh, uh, the production company busy. So it was those exact four experiences that I was able to put on my resume by being at KWTX that directly led to what at that time was my dream job at the Dallas Mavericks. And um, I was director of broadcast operations and, and uh, manager of reunion production company. And then one year later, my boss left and I became the, the full-fledged director of broadcasting for the Mavericks. And I was there for 14 seasons after that. Well, now that's a big break. <laughs> yes. My, my income went from here to here, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's man. Crazy. Uh, yeah, where do I, where do I even start there? Um, whew, okay. So, so you got 14 seasons under your belt with the Mavericks mm -hmm. and I guess, I guess where we can start is like what we're, what were some of the experience? What were some of the biggest experiences that you had, in, in terms of not necessarily life changing, but the probably the most memorable ones, whether it was on the court or if it was just within within the industry itself, the with your broad with the broadcasters or with executives of the team. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's there's lots of relationships that you have to you know, consider, considering you're a manager and a director. Like you've had plenty of colleagues to work with. So, uh, what right. were, what were some of those experiences like what, at that profile since it's a much bigger jump than. Right. Teams? Right. Well, there, man, um, there's so many things that just, there's, there's people you get to work with people you get to encounter. Um, a lot of them are people that, um, you, you've watched or idolized when you were younger. And, um, the, the first one I would say is, um, during my time with the Mavericks, I had three former players end up working for me on our broadcasts. One was on the radio broadcast, uh, two at different times were on the television broadcast. Um, they were Derek Harper, Rolando Blackman, and Brad Davis. Well, I remember watching those three guys 
when I was in college and just out of college starting my career at KWTX, watching those guys lead the Mavericks to the Western Conference Finals against the Lakers in some epic, ma- epic mm-hmm. matchups and uh, just loving that team and loving those guys and watching them play. And so it was extremely surreal to not only be walking the same halls with them and getting to know them and becoming friends with them, but them calling me their boss. I'm like, what? <laughs> that, that, that's crazy, you know? But that's, you know, so that, that's one experience. Um, I, man, there's too many of them to name, but, you know, another one is just when Mark Cuban bought the team and uh, now you're working for this crazy billionaire and uh, we're working for this crazy billionaire right at the time when things were starting to transition from standard definition to high definition. Um, you know, high definition was already a thing, but now it was becoming more mainstream. And Mark Cuban was very into high def. And so having the opportunity to be the person that he was leaning on to lead the Mavericks into the era, era of HD was just huge. And so that w- that was something that was, you know, a really nice thing to be able to put on the resume and uh, and to be involved in. I mean, Mark Cuban started a company called HDNet that's now Access TV. And if you really want to get technical about it, I was the first employee of HDNet. Um, <laughs> I was really still the director of broadcasting for the Mavericks, but Mark Cuban made me de facto the the first employee of HDNet helping together content that they could start putting on the network and, and um, start the ball rolling. And then, and then once they uh, got a few more people in there, I was able to kind of step away from that and go back to my, my Mavericks role. But um, you know, that was really cool. Uh, You know, just working for Mark Cuban in general is a very cool thing. People ask me two questions about him. One, what's he like? And the other one, what's it like to work for him? Well, here's what he's like. Steve Nash gave the best answer to this on David Letterman show. Nash said, uh, Nash said, Mark Cuban is, um, he's got two personalities and both of them are ADHD. (laughs) That's the best way to describe him. The second question about what's he like to work for? Well, anytime you work for an eccentric billionaire, it's going to be a handful. But I'll tell you this, I would rather work for a passionate pain in the rear end than a complacent nice guy because that passionate guy and and that even though he can be a a handful and a pain that passionate guy is going to take you places and allow you to do things you never would have otherwise done and that's what i found with mark cuban i found him to be fair um you know look i was i was on the uh you know a lot of your communication with him is via email and um I had personal interactions with him, but, you know, not nearly as much as the emails. And, um, you know, I was I was on the end of some not so pleasant emails. But at the same time, I was at the end of some very gratifying emails. And so um, uh, I would not trade the decade that I that I worked with Mark Cuban for anything. And, and one of those things that he allowed me to do that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to do is uh, he was the spearhead for us producing a game in, in 3D in 2008, Dallas Mavericks versus Los Angeles Clippers. And uh, the game was being broadcast to a local theater with 300 invited guests. And it made history because it was the very first 3D broadcast that had been transmitted from venue to theater via satellite. And we got the wow. NBA involved. They helped with all of that. But... I was able to uh, produce that broadcast. Another gentleman directed it. And I was working side by side with Vince Pace, who is the director of 3D photography for Avatar. And um, being able to work with him was an opportunity that never would have happened without me ending up at the Mavericks and never would have happened without Mark Cuban buying the Mavericks and, and pushing all of this forward. So... Um, just really cool experiences that I've been able to be a part of. That that's first of all, that's incredible. Uh, just the amount of relationships, number one, but also experiences and stories. Like there's there's a wealth of 
of history all there that we're not even going to get to, but just, oh, just man. that alone is, we're, we're is already. What I've just told you is barely scratching the surface. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if only we had 10 hours and, and I know and not like, man, and not one. Uh, we, we may I, have to I do, do one episode. Ask, why not? <laughs> well, I might as well. <laughs> um, uh, there, there is one question with, with Mark Cuban considering since he started, um, broadcast.com and that was what led to his wealth that eventually helped him buy the Mavericks. There were some growing pains of the dot-com era and the transition with all the technology at that time. Did you happen to go through any growing pains with some of those transitions throughout those 14 years? I didn't go through growing pains with the dot-com era, but I did go through uh, growing pains with just some of the, the various technologies that were changing. Um, and, and again, I think the biggest major shift that was, was happening during my time with the Mavericks was that shift from standard definition to high definition. And, um, and so figuring out exactly how we were, cause, cause Mark was pushing that very hardly. And so, you know, figuring out how we were going to become mainstream with HD broadcast, you know, was, was a process. And uh, back then they weren't just creating a whole bunch of HD mobile units. So that wasn't, you know, something that was mainstream. Um, so Mark had gotten with uh, Mobile TV Group, which was our uh, television truck vendor that we were using for our TV broadcast. And uh, Phil Garvin was the... Uh, uh, owner and CEO at Mobile TV Group. And uh, so Phil built two HD only trucks. But the way these trucks were designed is they were designed to attach themselves to a standard def truck. And, and then basically convert cameras. They had HD cameras, but they would, they would convert some of the signals, up convert um, in, into their system. And, and that's the way we were putting a handful of uh, broadcasts on HDNet. And um, it was only our over-the-air broadcasts, so meaning we had about 30 of our games that were going on over-the-air television. So we would take those 30 games and then allocate about 10 to 20 of those for HD broadcasts. And so it was a very cumbersome way to do HD. And then it was probably two years later that, okay, we're starting to build HD mobile units now, and so... So Phil Garvin had started building standalone HD mobile units, and those came into the mainstream very quickly after that. And then we were off and running, and the the cost point came down. Uh, more and more people had HD sets, and and then everything took off. But to get to that point, man, there were a lot of growing pains. Another big growing pain, and I, I don't even know, you, you know, I talked about 3D, doing a broadcast in 3D. So the shift from standard def to HD, that, that became mainstream. 3D did not become mainstream. Um, mm -hmm. the, the cost of doing 3D, people having 3D sets, people wearing glasses versus, you know, not having to wear glasses or whatever. There was, there was too many hoops to jump through with 3D, I think, for it to really catch hold. So it, it became just a uh, kind of a... A circus trick. <laughs> it became a, a niche. And so, um, but it was fun to be involved in it during that time. But, you know, one of the big challenges, I'll, one of the things that with that 3D broadcast, I will never forget, is um, Vince Pace, you know, was our partner coming in to help us do the broadcast. Well, when he found out the reason we were doing it via satellite is because we thought that we had secured a fiber transmission path at a hub near the theater. Well, we found out that that fiber was not there and they weren't going to be able to get it in in time because the broadcast was a week away. And um, so the transmission basically fell through on the broadcast. So, and you can't do a broadcast without transmission. So the league was suggest. I called the league to see if they could give us some help. They were suggesting satellite transmission. Um, but Vince Pace, uh, was not really on board with that because it had never been done. So I called up 
a guy named Steve Helmuth at the NBA, VP of Technology. I said, hey, Steve, this is our situation. The transmission's not going to work. Uh, can you guys help us maybe with a satellite option? And uh, he said, yeah, I'm totally on board with that. And, and then he, he's like, wait a minute, I've got Vince Pace on the other line. So he puts Vince in his other ear and, and he's talking to Vince, talking to me. We're going all, all three of us kind of back and forth in this conversation. And um, in essence, what happened is he convinced Vince to go ahead and try it because Vince didn't want to do this because it, his name was going to be on it. And if it failed, it was going to be a black eye for him. And so, and it was really going to be a black eye for all of us, um, but I especially did not want it to be a black eye for my boss, Mark Cuban. And so I was doing everything I could to make this thing happen. So um, he convinced Vince that, you know what, I, I think we can make this work. So Vince agreed to do it, but he said, we've got to test it first. And so he came, uh, we set up all the cameras, his truck, truck was there, his crew was there. Everything was set up. Me, Vince, and a guy named Mike Rikosa, who's the VP of, of uh, engineering at the NBA at the time, uh, we went over to the theater uh, there in Dallas, and uh, the three of us were sitting there watching the signal come back from the American Airlines Center. And Vince was having the, the crew there punch camera to camera to camera to camera, do different camera moves, look at different motions, had people out there on the floor doing different things, and it was pristine there was not a hiccup in it. And I was so relieved and Vince goes, yeah, okay, we're going to do this. We're doing it. So um, anyway, but that's a long way of talking about, you know, some of the real challenges and, and roadblocks that you hit, you know, as you, you know, growing pains um, that you hit as you go through. I'm, I'm, it's kind of sad that 3D didn't catch on because it was so, so fun to work on. But you know, it was a nice experience and it really grew me. It really made me grow and learn, get kind of outside my comfort level. And it also allowed me to work with a really cool Hollywood cinematographer. So, um, you know, <laughs> something that I didn't think I was going to do being a sports sports guy. But um, so, yeah, there's there's all kinds of, of growing pains. I mean, we're still the industry is always going to be in growing pains. It just is. Um, when I first came to the Mavericks, I used to lament that the technology is changing so fast. It's like changing every five years. <laughs> now it's changing every like five days, it seems like, you know, I mean, it's just yeah. the, the changes are, are much tighter. And so, you know, man, if you're going to be in this business or any, any broadcast or film business or anything like that, you, you had better stay on top of the emerging technology because if, if not, you're going to get left behind. Yeah. Um, just the, just the changes to like the, the micro changes to our graphics machines mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll get into how all of that is put together, but yeah, the, the little, the little changes, we know that they're uh, every single one's an improvement when it takes away what we've, already been working on what we've built on for six months to a year it, it's a reset but then we know okay eventually it'll get better okay, the, if we if we just go with this new system it'll make our lives so much easier it's just the setup process is going to take a little uh a little while to get acclimated the closest thing i can think of is the touchscreen that we that we've been using at at valley sports with the 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 technology wasn't 100 percent complete by the time we got it but it was in working condition to the point where if we just avoided all the pitfalls no one would notice and it's it's those things of like can you test can you break it to the point where you know exactly how to avoid those situations and by taking right. care of that early on before the nba nhl season starts we're able to tell our talent okay this is how you'll break it so don't break it, and then we can we can have a good show. Uh, so lots of, I, I think for me the, I I like thinking that I'm a tech guy, but engineering is a whole other stratosphere of of technical terms and knowledge that I will probably never have. But with whatever technology that I am working with, I do like being able to evolve with the times, and that that yeah. seems to be. A good thing in this industry that we're getting better and better 
equipment, a lot of better stuff over time. You know, Ezreal, um, I, I have always said that um, from the producing side of the business, I break equipment, I don't fix it. <laughs> I'm a user. That's an, inter that's an interesting <laughs> phrase. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Engineers fix it, I break it. <laughs> well, you know, I don't, I don't want the engineers to get on my bad side, or it's, no, I don't want to get on no, their no. bad side. So, yeah, yeah things happen. That's just kind of a, a figure of speech, but yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm amazed at what engineers can do. Yeah, uh, one thing that I, that I did mention with the stuff about your job at the Mavericks was about your on the court relationships. Now, when it comes to the actual games, right? Not just when, uh, in your time with the Mavericks, but also when you eventually moved on to Fox Sports. The 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 games, the events that you that you guys were able to showcase, like night after night after night, the talent that you saw on the court. What was basketball like um, throughout the, especially since you were running through the years of Dirk, and like you you. Mm -hmm. You grew up, or at least you came out of high school and uh, and college, watching the '80s teams. But then, as you were with Cuban, it was basically Dirk Nash, and then eventually Jason Kidd, and and so on. So, what 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 did you really see on the court that was, you know, some of the most exciting battles? Man, there were a lot of them, but um, you know, just the the way the game itself changed. Um, when I arrived at the Mavericks is really at the precipice of when bigs were starting to shoot from the outside. And it made them harder to defend because now they had, they weren't just an inside threat, they were an outside threat. And, um, and, and Dirk was obviously a really big part of that. Um, I remember Dirk, Dirk arrived at the Mavericks at the end of my first season. And I remember all of us going, hmm, who is this 19-year-old German kid? And is he really going to be any good? Uh, we didn't understand um, the tool belt of skill that this guy had. We didn't understand the work ethic that this guy had. As unconventional as it was, we didn't understand the work ethic that this guy had. And um, by then, I had gotten to know Donnie Nelson, who was the uh, GM of the team. And I remember Donnie saying, uh, this kid's for real. You, you just wait. And um, man, he, he was not wrong. And uh, it didn't take long for us to realize how special Dirk was. And, um, and then we started seeing that, you know, throughout the game of basketball. Um, with the the uh, the inside out threat and um, more three point shooting, and um, I, I guess for me, as I watch it now, um, these scores are crazy. You know, <laughs> yeah, one thirty to one twenty three. You know, and um, <laughs> there, you know, I thought I thought there was a lot less defense in the game right around that time that the inside, the bigs became an, an outside threat, but it's, it's like on steroids now. Um, I feel like I'm watching an all-star game every, every time I watch any NBA game. Um, but um, it's just the way the game's evolved. It's the way it's changed. Some people like it, some people don't, you know, um, that's a philosophical thing. But um, I've had the chance to really watch some really talented players uh, and, um, you know, um, from Dirk, obviously, to LeBron, to Kobe, Kobe Bryant, um, Allen Iverson, um, Penny Hardaway. Um, there's so many, many talented players. Um, and then, obviously, Steph Curry and, um, and, and what he's brought to the game. I, I really feel like um, there was another major shift um, – in the way the game was played when, when Steph Curry really kind of came into his own. So, uh, you know, being able to sit there and have a front row seat for all of that. The, the other thing I really noticed um, as my time with the Mavericks progressed 
is how much faster, stronger, and more athletic the players became. And so the game itself sped up, um, it seemed like, um, you know, not drastically. It wasn't like snap of a finger, okay, this year it's this, this year it's that. But just when I, when I watch now and then go back and watch 10, 15 years ago, you, you can tell the differences, you know, at that point. And I think it's that way with any sport um, over the years. The, the games are always going to involve, but, man, uh, I, I think it was our for, uh, or my former boss, your still boss, Jason Walsh, asked me one time, he said, um, so what is it about basketball that you love? And, and I said, it's the athleticism. I mean, and what I what the what I see these guys do, it's like it, it, it defies physics um, at times. You know, that's another one. The Matrix. Uh, being able to get to know him, he was another broadcaster that uh, guy that became a broadcaster that worked for me for a short time. But um, watching his game, uh, I really enjoyed his game. But yeah, I hope that answers your question. But oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, uh, lots of, lots of history in the game. People that I may have not been able to see live. I know I didn't get to watch Kobe in person, but I saw plenty of his games in television and it wasn't until a, about a year and a month ago that I finally saw LeBron and mm -hmm. Kyrie in person for the first time. And then a week later, Kevin Durant and Chris Paul and, Devin Booker yep. for the first time. So that was like watching them in person. I tend to retain more of what I see when I'm at the arena versus when I'm watching it on television, oh, just because definitely. there's, there's, there's so, there's so much going on in the broadcast that tries to keep you engaged in all mm -hmm. the facets, all the storylines. When you're at the arena, the only thing you can focus on is everything that's on the court. Uh, right. But just the way that these guys play, it, and I'm sure that if I were closer up in the in the stands, since I'm up in the in the, in the higher sections, I could notice the speed. <laughs> if right. I'm like courtside, um, yeah. just watching them zoom by, it, I did see. I I kid you not, I saw um, a, a YouTube short last night, and Kevin Durant was sitting on the wing. Phoenix had um, had had the ball. Someone was dribbling up the ball, but he was just set up and had a defender on him and someone was kind of heck I wouldn't say heckling him but they were just updating him about the Texas score in the NCAA tournament it was I think they were playing Tennessee on that night and then all of a sudden you just see this whoosh and I was like who is that it was the referee it wasn't even a player it was just the referee right. zooming by the screen I said, even the referees have gotten faster. What's yeah. going on? So, and then, and then the rest of the players, you see them finally making a layup and it wasn't even, I think it was Drew Eubanks making the layup. He's not the fastest guy on the team, but you got guys like Tyrese Maxey in Philadelphia, De'Aaron yeah. Fox in Sacramento who are moving at breakneck speeds that you know, if you, if you were to see that live, I think would completely eclipse the guys of the past, especially when, the offensive superstars of the 2000s were bigger men who didn't right. have speed as their as their main uh, as their main characteristic. Right. But the the way the way the game has definitely changed. I've I've tried my best to take note of it through through the numbers and the and the stats is one that's part of my job. But also mm -hmm. when you don't play professional basketball, when you haven't played basketball at, at that kind of a level the best way to create an argument is by objective data. So that's all I can go on. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have no experience to draw from, but the, uh, the game, I guess to me is the, the, the game has found some bumps in the road, but it's just that everyone is so good. Everyone is shooting the ball so well that mm -hmm. it's, you know, hoping that someone misses is now part of the defense rather than actually affecting their shot. It's it's so impossible, especially with the way that the bigger men... Dirk was probably one of the first of his kind. There there have been others, other Europeans who have been great shooters, other, other bigger men who have been great shooters, but Dirk was probably the one that put a lot of the international players out on the forefront, outside of guys like Hakeem Olajuwon, uh, Hakeem Olajuwon and Dikembe Mutombo and, and so on and so forth. But 
there were more players like Dirk after Dirk than before him. Right. And, and because of that, the, uh, I guess the, he had, he had such skill sets that were unguardable, especially that one legged fadeaway that he developed over time, but he didn't have everything. Right, like Tim Duncan had a lot of stuff, but not everything. Dirk had a lot of stuff, not everything. Shaq had a lot of stuff, but not not shooting. But then you get to the guys today who are the, who are their size, and you see Victor Wembanyama, mm. and there's nothing he can't do, and he's already a rookie. Right, he's he's just a rookie. So having him at seven foot four, seven foot five, doing the things that Dirk could do, the things that Tim Duncan and David Robinson could do, the things that Shaq could do. It and he might not be the last. We might see more of that as time moves on. That it's kind of how the game has gone. The efficiency just keeps going up and up and up yeah. to the point where maybe the game has to, just like broadcast television, has to evolve and yeah. adapt to the times. But you know, there there have been people who have more experience than than you or I do on the court with uh, who've had defensive adjustments and suggestions such as you know taking away the three the defensive three seconds maybe that will um, allow bigger men to be in the paint a little bit more and then that would that would prevent the offense from being able to have an easy cut especially with the speed that we just talked about the dexterity and the athleticism of all these guys having someone sit under the basket for the entire possession could drastically change offensive game plans uh, as well as defensive game plans and uh, the the way that JJ Redick and LeBron James were mentioning in their most recent episode of Mind the of Mind the Game, their new podcast that came out a week ago, mm-hmm. they were bringing up this concept of two nine, and of course when you're thinking about it in from a fan's perspective, the first time you hear two nine, you you have no idea what it is, but the moment that they explain it, it makes one hundred percent sense because it's part of, of the facet of playing defense where two nine is that you spend, you try to spend 2.9 seconds in the paint before you try to get within an arm's length of an offensive player that's coming into the paint or just stepping out of the paint so that you can come back in to avoid the three second defensive call. Right. So, you know, those, those kinds of changes, you know, we, we may not, we may not see for a little bit, but, I, I do wonder how how the game will evolve with the skill sets of the new guys and where where it could go from here. But I think it's it's in good hands considering who's on the court, who's playing. Adam Silver leading the league, and it's just a matter of us highlighting all of all of those changes and making sure that the fan knows what what's going on and all that. Right. Crazy. Um, Sometimes the, I wonder if they're going to need to like move the three point line back, uh, raise the basket. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh man! I, Does the court I wonder how many shots we... for these guys. I don't know. Yeah, uh, that that would break so much muscle memory. Yeah. If uh, if if the three point line were to move or the, the I'm not like, saying I would be for that. Too. I'm just saying you know, <laughs> I mean, some of these shots are so ridiculous. It's like okay. Yeah. Um, let's let's transition to your time into strictly sports broadcasting from mm-hmm. the regional network side. Um, so you've gone. We we were able to spend a lot of time on your time with the Mavericks. Mm-hmm. It the relationship is different, or at least you're in a different spot within the right. entirety of the uh, uh, the collective by being a part of the RSN. So what was your role at Fox Sports and how did you then migrate your skills from your time with the Mavericks to then bring on the success that you guys did, that you guys had in the regions that you covered? Okay. Um, so, you know, the um, once I went to the regional sports network side, I always had... Um, in my role with the Mavericks, a very close relationship with the regional sports network. They were our TV partner. So um, uh, it was just basically 
changing hats. You know, I'm wearing a different hat now at that point uh, when I went to the RSN. And so my role at the RSN was um, as the coordinating producer for the NBA product for three of the regional sports networks, Fox Sports Southwest, Fox Sports Oklahoma, and Fox Sports New Orleans, um, which, as you know, those three were all housed in Irving, Texas, in the same out of the same studios. Um, but they were considered to be kind of, a, I guess you would call Southwest a super uh, regional uh, that had some tentacles with it. And so those tentacles extended to Oklahoma and New Orleans, uh, as well as, you know, within the Southwest region, you know, the, the coverage of the Dallas area, the San Antonio area. Um, and uh, at one point, uh, the Houston area. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different, um, and, and I'm saying that, I mean, that's just where the teams were, obviously extended into Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana. Um, and so all of those uh, areas kind of encompass that region. Um, and so what I tell people that from going to the team to going to the network is I just went from one NBA team to four NBA teams. And um, that's uh, <laughs> that. But the but the role was was different once I got to the network from the standpoint that um, I was I was no longer the, the the looking out necessarily for the best interest of the team, even though I was. But my hat was different. I was I was now looking out for the best interest of the network first, and um, I think it helped me coming from the team already knowing, you know, how the team thought and what the teams, um, what the team wanted from the regional sports broadcast. And, um, and then being able to come to the network side, I learned a lot about what the regional sports network wanted and why they wanted it. I already kind of knew a little bit of that uh, when I was with the team, but I didn't always know why. And, and so being able to understand, okay, this is why we want um, our graphics this way. Um, this is why we want this this way. Um, and, you know, it was so multifaceted, but being able to learn that side of it uh, with the perspective of having been with the team, I think made me uh, better at what I was able to do at the network. So the from the time that you started at Fox, we, we talked about evolving technologies throughout uh, throughout your early years. What were some of the changes that you were able to help navigate the network through from your first year to through the, I guess right before the pandemic started, because that's another shift that we'll, we're going to mm, get into yeah. in a little bit. Ooh, well, that's a, that's a tough one. I was probably with the network for about seven years before the pandemic hit. And, um, we, a couple of things. One, we were not into it quite yet. The pandemic is really what pushed both of these things that I'm going to talk about um, more into the forefront, but it was already something that we were kind of looking at and experimenting with. Uh, but one being going to the IP-based or internet protocol-based uh, workflow, you know, where... Um, and again, not being an engineer, all of the details of that, I don't know all of the technical aspects of. I just know um, that the, the, the workflow is, um, it, it takes you really kind of, it's just a different way of doing it and uh, allegedly a better way of doing it. Although there's, you know, there's been some hurdles to overcome and, and, and get some things right with that. But, um, you know, things like latency and, and different things like that. But um, uh, the the world of, of what we call Remy's, you know, um, these um, broadcasts that are being done from a studio or another location, not the venue, where your crew and your control room might be in Dallas while the game is going on and your TV truck and cameras are in Los Angeles. Uh, and you're doing the game just as if you were in Los Angeles, but your whole crew and even your broadcasters are back in an Irving studio. And so that uh, is, was already um, being done, not quite as much by our network, but I know that ESPN was doing some of that. Um, they were starting into that foray. I do know that, um, like, for instance, uh, I think it was back in, I can't remember if it was, um, I think it was 2016 or 2017, 
that uh, the World Cup was in Russia. And um, a lot of the broadcasts were originating from the Los Angeles, Fox Los Angeles studios. Uh, and so instead of sending the crew to Russia, they were just getting the camera feeds back in and the broadcasters were all in a studio and, and the director and the, and the producer and everyone was in a studio in Los Angeles. So um, that kind of describes that, that Remy. And um, it was being experimented with, first of all, really it was kind of a cost-cutting measure. Um, I mean, my goodness, there's tons of cost with travel and entertainment, especially if you're going overseas for, you know, multiple weeks um, to try to do a major event like the World Cup. So, um, so that was, that was a big shift, um, obviously, um, to try to start experimenting with doing broadcasts this way. It was still conventional wisdom that the better way to do a broadcast was to send your whole crew, uh, or send at least your, uh, above the line crew, which is your producer, director, your, your talent, your associate producers, and then, uh, get a local crew, um, or, you know, but to, to be at the venue, that was, um, uh, the standard way of doing it, uh, it was always considered the better and best way of doing it. Um, but then COVID did change uh, a lot of that. So uh, those were some of the um, the two of the major things that I think were, were in the process of changing and then eventually full-fledged changed um, during, from the time I started with Fox to, to the time uh, that I'd left uh, a couple of years ago. So um, you know, th those are some, some, some pretty big shifts. We also had, you know, um, I, I, what I would call micro shifts in like the graphics platform, you know, going to the biz RT and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, making that transition doing, you know, some of the little tweaks that we were doing with, with some of those things. Um, um, some of the equipment was changing. Some of the way we use the equipment was changing. Um, Jason Walsh was very instrumental in this, uh, was the, the main instrumental person in this, bringing EBS into the studio environment. Um, and, and to me, that was genius because it's now, um, he, he saw the, um, uh, the studio personnel as being kind of the farm system for the remote broadcast. And so being able to have some of the same equipment inside that studio so that the people that were using that equipment would be better prepared to make their transition to the remote broadcast um, was really, I think, well thought out. And it was met with a lot of resistance. You know, people were like, you know, EBS is designed for a, a live broadcast for, for replays and stuff like that, which we're not doing in the studio. So, you know, people were questioning, why do we really need to invest in this? But it turned out to be, I think, a pretty good investment because we've now seen more and more of those guys that were working in the studio, um, on an EBS, for instance, um, going to the truck and being lead EBS operators now for teams. So um, I, I think that, you know, things like that were uh, a big part of, you know, what we were doing at, during my time at the network. And I was really, really proud to be a part of it. One of the most recent people that I think of when you mentioned that transition to EBS um, and how it uh, benefits our studio crew is Joe Abalmos, who was our... Mm -hmm. Mavs Live EVS operator for right. at least for my for my year in 22 23 and was partnered with Michaela Lewis the year before and had been on Spurs as well. He became the the lead EVS operator in the truck for the Memphis Grizzlies on Valley Sports right. Southeast. And, right. And him being able to make that jump wouldn't have happened if he didn't get EVS experience in the in the control room. And th this is what Jason Jason Walsh has told us in in meetings like this was this was the purpose of mm -hmm. having truck level equipment in the studio and having us build up our skills so that if we wanted to go into the truck we could do it and not have as much of an of a steep climb to make yeah so well, and the, you mentioned the, uh, you mentioned Michaela Lewis. She made the transition from the studio to be the associate producer in the Mavericks truck. So that was a, mm -hmm. a, another example in a different position um, that kind of played a role in that. Uh, you know, and, and mentioning Joa, I mean, 
golly, the kid wasn't even shaving when I got there uh, back in 2013. <laughs> and so watch, it's, it's been fun to kind of watch guys like that and their progression and their growth uh, to be able to be where they are now. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it, we'll, we'll hopefully see him whenever, whenever the Grizzly season is over. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's great to, to, to be working with them and then watch them fulfill those next level opportunities and especially when you're just starting out seeing how young they are and how how much how much time they spent in the business and then getting those opportunities you know that you know one day that that door will open at somewhere hopefully within the same spot but you know yeah. it, it having that farm system there i think i think it's been beneficial for all of us the uh, the transition to the viz rt i've mentioned on on uh, on some of my solo episodes, how I build the graphics, how uh, how I can control certain aspects of it all. There, I've even shown some snapshots of of some examples that I've used and some that we didn't even get on the air. What are some of the benefits that came with transitioning from what you previously had, the days of Chiron, and and what came before mm-hmm. the Viz RT system to eventually this. 3D system of of the entire Viz family. Now we have Viz Trio, but we also have Viz Artist, which runs the touchscreen. Mm-hmm. So there, there's been there's been a lot of transition there. But how how did you see the benefits? What what were the benefits of that transition there? Well, um, and I'm probably the wrong person to ask that because I'm not a graphics person. I'm not deep into the technology. But what I did know was this, um, and and you, I'm going to go back to growing pains. We had growing pains going to the Viz RT. So there were, um, because it was new and we were used to being doing this, but now we had this, it, 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 as with a lot of these changes, it created limitations. Uh, there were certain things that, you know, I, I would hear the graphics operators talking about, well, I, I, you know, I could do this over here, but I can't do it here. Um, and then they had to let the system evolve learn more of the system and then, you know, let it catch up. But the one thing I, I did know is, you know, there's there's certain things that um, just from a, a video standpoint uh, that you can do within the BizRT, you know, used to be it was just like a very uh, stagnant um, piece of graphic gear uh, is, is what we were we dealing with before. And now, Um, not that the infinite didn't have, you know, some animation, but the animation and video capabilities within the Viz RT, uh, were just, you know, another level. And so it allows us, it allowed us to do more on one box, um, and, and take some of the load off of BBS and take some of the load off of, um, you know, a DBE up on the front bench or whatever, uh, to be able to, you know, do more within that one box, um, so that, you know, the rest of the broadcast could augment in their own way as well. You said the Infini was the system you guys used before? Viz? I can't remember. I, it, yes. No, okay. But I don't remember if the Infini was the one right before the Viz RT or... <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, it, was, it was Duet, Chiron Duet, then Chiron Infinite, and I... Man, I, I'm missing one in there somewhere. I think there's 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 one, but my my brain's gone, gone blank on it, so... Uh, that's how that's how I that's how I show my inexperience when when I hear Infinia I don't even think of Chiron because I didn't associate those right. two together. But there there we are. <laughs> yes. Uh, right. But it, it yeah it's good good to learn new things. I, that's that's what the show is for. I want to bring people on so I can learn new things. Yeah. Uh, I do too. I want to learn new um, things. From you. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did how did the pandemic I guess caused the company to evolve in a way that was did it pro, let's say did it provide more efficiency in how you guys operated the broadcast or was it just something that you had to overcome and then hope to come all the way back Um that is a really good question and well framed question because um I I think the initial thought process in people's minds was it was something that we were going to have to deal with, something that we were going to have to adjust to, but then when it's over, we'll come all the way back. I 
I knew I had this feeling, no, we're not coming all the way back. This is going to change the way we do things. And um, because we were already experimenting with it. We, it. You know, when we first had to do a Remy um, in our studio because of COVID, that wasn't the first time a Remy had ever been done, you know? <laughs> and so it it wasn't like, you know, now, now we... Yeah, we had to do a lot of planning. We had to figure out our workspaces, where we're going to put our announcers, what rooms are we going to put what equipment in, um, where's our studio going to be, how are we going to work all of this out. Because remember, we had six pro teams running out of two studios. And if all of that is going to be coming out of the Irving studio, um, and you're you're now putting... Um, not only your pregame and post games in those studios, but you're also putting the game broadcasts in those studios. Man, that's a that's a tall order. So uh, we had a lot of adjustments we were having to make with that. Not only in our Irving studio, but also in Oklahoma City, San Antonio, and New Orleans. And so we were really having to map out and think through. Okay, how are we going to do these broadcasts in Oklahoma City? Um. Are we going to bring a mobile unit in? And, and we already knew the answer to that was yes, we're going to bring a mobile unit in. Uh, but where are we going to put the announcers? How are we going to do, you know, all of these broadcasts? Um, because at that point, you know, we're, we're not traveling anybody. The, the hardest part of this, too, was doing all of this not knowing when the sports were going to resume. Um, they mm -hmm. shut everything down. But then we're in limbo. So we're making all these plans. We're doing all these things, preparing for when it might come back, but we don't know when that is. So that's, that's one hurdle. Then at the same time, on the other hand, over here, we're having to come up with programming to fill the network space for the live games that aren't happening. So we're working really closely with our programming director, going to the archives, going back, finding classic games from all of our teams to air on the network and uh, replay and working with the NBA on, you know, getting the rights to some national broadcasts that we didn't even produce at Valley Sports or at Fox Sports at the time. And so, um, you know, if you want to go back and do re-air all of the NBA finals from the Spurs or the Mavericks one of those years, you had to get the rights from the NBA to use the ABC broadcast, which we did. So, um, you know, there were a lot of hoops to jump through with that, though. And so uh, on one side, we're, we're playing this operational game on what's it going to look like when it comes back. And on the other hand, we're trying to fill programming. So, you know, we had a lot of plates spinning, even with that dead time where there was no live sports going on. Um, and so um, that was you know, just a, a lot to, to do and undertake. But, um, and then they came back, you know, and in the NBA's case, they came back with the, with the bubble in Orlando. And um, we, we got briefed on that from the NBA and how, how the, the pool feeds were going to work. And, and, and at that point, then we had to start executing the plan that we had been putting in place and then adjusting the plan based on what the parameters of the bubble were and, uh, and how all of that was going to work. And so, there were all these moving parts with it, but we finally did kind of get into this groove where we're like, okay, we're doing this and this is the way we're doing it. Well, you know, as, as one might think, you know, well, we're not having to travel. Hmm. We're, we're saving money here. We're saving money there. We're doing this, doing that, you know, and so uh, the bean counters, the executives, and, and even some of the production people were like, man, this is, this is probably going to, going to become more mainstream. And it did, you know, it didn't eliminate being at the venues. It didn't completely eliminate it. And I don't know that it, it ever will completely do that uh, because there is something to be said for actually being on site, being there, uh, doing the game, uh, some of the relationship bonds you, you get, some of, you know, just being at the venue, uh, especially for your announcers. If, you know, if they're able to be there, that's, you know, preferable. But, um, but man, there's, there's so many advantages um, to not doing it at the venue, you know, and that's not just um, from a standpoint of money, even though that's a big part of it, but these guys, I mean, 
sports broadcasting's hard. Um, people traveling, it's hard on families because you're having to be away from your family. Well, now, now you got these producers and these talent that are going, huh, what, I don't have to travel? I don't have to go on the road and I can still do these road games? Sign me up, you know. They're able to sleep in their own bed at night, um, go to their kids' Little League game, you know, um, on, on what would have been an off day uh, if they were on a West Coast road trip. So, yeah, I mean, it, it completely changed everything. And then I'll bring Phil Garvin back into the conversation. Phil Garvin and Mobile TV Group um, started uh, building out uh, cloud control um, and, and designing mobile units to do cloud control and, uh, and getting that technology uh, up and running. And so that was, that was when COVID happened. I mean, he would, he had, I think he had already been working on that prior to COVID. And COVID was like, okay, that was the impetus to go, okay, we've got to move forward with this and move forward with it strong. And so what are we doing now? Well, a large percentage of the road games of all of the teams coming out of Bally Sports Southwest are doing cloud control and not mm -hmm. traveling uh, their full crew uh, to do road games. And um, so it's really become more the new normal. We actually did just get the New Orleans crew to come through and check out the cloud control room uh, about a week ago, maybe a week and a half yeah, ago. I heard. I heard it was they were, kicking because the they were setting up. Yeah, they were. Uh, they set up their <laughs> cloud control over New Orleans. So uh, now they're now they're all in, I guess, and probably for the rest of the season, at least until the playoffs. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of speaking of playoffs, that um, that twenty twenty year when you know both. It, the bubble for the NBA was down in Orlando, so it was still within United States soil. The bubble for the NHL was up in Canada, and because of right. the, we've had some latency issues when it, when we talk to when the Dallas Stars are up there, and we want to talk to Daryl Ray or Razor for those of us in the those of you in the local market, and it, it gets to a point where you know we we don't even wait for him to say thank you at the end of the of the of his hit in the pregame or the postgame because it's it's just going to take two. It takes five seconds just for him to hear us or, or Brian Ray or somebody to tell uh, with whatever they're saying. So I can imagine the uh, there's a there was probably m more of a technical hiccup here and there. I guess with the NHL broadcast as they were finishing up their season and into the early round of the, uh, the probably the first round of the playoffs since the stars went all the way to the Stanley cup that year. Um, did you, did you notice, any, were there any hiccups that you saw that were a little more demonstrative than there were for our, for our other NBA teams around that time? Um, no, I mean, it was fairly similar across the board. Latency was always an issue. Um, so mm -hmm. you had, uh, things that you had to kind of work with there. Um, to be able to, you know, kind of overcome that. But, um, you know, there were, there were all kinds of just little technical things because think about it, you're trying to get your signals from thousands of miles away back to your control room to do a broadcast with. And, and so it, it's just natural that that latency and some of the different um, technical challenges of just getting, you know, you're transmitting everything back <laughs> to another location. So um, it's not like you're sitting there with your EVS in the truck. Your EVS in the truck is a thousand miles away when you're doing cloud control. Your, op your, your, your operating panel is here, <laughs> but the mainframe is in the truck um, thousands of miles away. So, you know, again, there's, there's always going to be challenge with that, but I don't, I don't, I don't think, you know, I think that was different from one sport to another. Uh, but I think the challenges were all very similar. I, I don't know that you could say, you know, yes, NHL had this challenge that the NBA didn't have, but then the NBA had this challenge that NHL didn't have. So, um, it, it all kind of evened out just to, you know, the big picture way of saying is saying it is it was a challenge for everyone. Um, to be able to do broadcast this way. And it was just one of those things that uh, people had to figure out a way to overcome it and, uh, and work through it. With all of these changes, I do, I do wonder from your status within the company, 
how often did you hear feedback from those who were who were having to execute on these shows and and uh, how did you find ways to i guess accommodate the crew for you know the, for some of the i guess more extreme issues that they were having like how can we how can we solve this puzzle or how can we right. overcome this situation like what what feedback did you really take in from the crew that was out there on a night, on a nightly basis that you then formulated a plan to then give them more more improvements yeah so um i don't remember all of the exact instances because it was a couple of years ago and um you know but but what i do remember is yeah there were some specific things like one of the things that you would do is you would lay out your camera complement uh and the league would would basically you would tell the league what you wanted the league would lay it out um and, and you know okay coming down this line is going to be you know you're going to have a high tight here you're going to have an under the basket here or whatever but you'd lay out lay, lay out this compliment but sometimes uh, that compliment did not get laid out exactly by the league the way you really wanted it because for, for whatever reason and so you know after a show the director would come back and he would have like various notes and the producer they'd have various notes saying hey we need to contact the league and see if we can change this um we had this latency issue so we're talking to the engineers about that you know and so and then it was basically them and me communicating to the liaison at the league about some of the adjustments that we needed to make and then it was just a, it was a constant give and take and and a lot of that brought in our operations department too because they were very involved in in putting um, that document together, which was really kind of the, the production book and the playbook that we were running from um, for those bubble games. Um, and right now I'm thinking specifically of the games in the bubble um, during COVID. But um, uh, there, were, there were things that, you know, it was, it was really because they were all pool feeds coming from Turner trucks and ESPN trucks that the NBA was basically the central hub of communication on uh we were having to um take an nba created model and and bring it into ours and see how we could work back and forth uh, with the challenges that we were facing and see how they could ac accommodate what the challenges were so um and again i don't remember all the challenges i just know that you know latency was one i remembered and um, some of the uh, allocation of the camera complements was another. For instance, um, you only got so many cameras. And so they would have kind of a standard template, but we were like, we want to take this out of the template and we want to put this into the template. And sometimes they would question that going, well, why, then, then why, why are you doing that? And we're like going, because we want to. <laughs> <laughs> because it's going to be better for our broadcast or whatever, you know. And so, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things like, hey, we're the producers. We're just needing you to help us do this. And and usually it was fine. We would we would get the accommodation made. But it, it was stuff like that. The biggest change for the company, for the RSN, would probably have been, at least from the outside looking in, because I'm, I'm thinking about my perspective, which I didn't join the company until 2022, was the transition uh, from the essentially the sale of 21st, uh, 21st Century Fox to Disney that eventually led to an auction. So how was, how was it going through that period from, from the Fox days to then being a part of Disney for a short time to then becoming Diamond Sports Group to then having the Bally name attached, like ex describe how that whole how, that whole transition took place and how how it okay. came to be. Well, it you know so it really started back in 2015, and um, in 2015 there were uh, just one day out of the blue there were notices from uh, upper management at uh, the Fox Los Angeles office um, to uh, the company. Um, that there were going to be notices of uh, offers uh, being sent out, offers to basically uh, take a um, an exit package that would allow you to leave the company and retire early, I guess, if you will. Um, and depending on how long you had been with the company, 
you were going to leave with a you know subst- you know more than a year's worth of salary um and um the, you know it was, it was a buyout offer basically they were going to buy out your contract if you had a contract or uh you know buy out your employment so um and it was being offered so uh, when i was there um i got the notice but i didn't get a buyout offer um uh we figured out they never said it but they figured we figured out the criteria was you were 55 or older or had been with the company at least 15 years and so um and typically you know i think they they send those buyout offers cuz those are some of the going to be some of your higher salaried or higher paid uh positions you know and so statistically so anyway they they put this buyout out there so that was the first sign that something was going on uh within the company um you know sometimes that happened and it's just the company making cutbacks uh but usually when a company's just making cutbacks they're they're doing layoffs uh this wasn't layoffs this was now there were a few layoffs that did kind of come into play shortly thereafter uh but minimal not very many it wasn't this massive layoff but those were the first signs that something was going on and then we start getting news that um 21st Century Fox is going to be sold to Disney. And um and so now it started to make sense about all of the buy, buy, buyout offers and all of that uh, going to uh, several of, of the employees across all the regional sports networks. And so um you know, writing was kind of on the wall, okay, the company's selling. That's what's happening. So um the um that news comes down and it's basically presented that you know it's it's primarily the movie entertainment part of the business is why Disney is wanting to acquire 21st Century Fox and and it was that was their their main purpose behind it was to acquire um all of the uh cinematic movie entertainment uh holdings um of 21st Century Fox and and bring that into the Disney family but you know fox had a lot of properties in there they had nat geo you know there's obviously the fox news channel there's um fox sports there's you know there's all these different you know entities that are within there uh, and the 22 regional sports networks being one of those entities so it was decided and determined that all of the entertainment and movie making part of the business would be part of the sale as would be the 22 regional sports networks now how that determination determination was made why it was made you know i i don't know for sure there's other people that do know that but um that that's that's the way it was presented so so you've got disney buying 21st century fox and included in that sale is are these regional sports networks So then the Department of Justice comes along and says, "Okay, we will approve this sale." But Disney, once the sale goes through, you have 90 days to sell the regional sports networks out of the portfolio. Now, why might why are they doing that? Well, who does ESP who does Disney own? They own ESPN. <laughs> ESPN is the giant in national sports television. the Fox Sports regional networks were the giant in regional sports television they did more regional sports than anyone else so um the department of justice saw a, a monopoly going on there they did not want the giant in national sports being within the same company as the giant in regional sports so they said you got to sell off the regional sports networks so um so within 90 days uh, so for 90 days i was a disney employee um without all the full perks of being a disney employee but you know we were disney employees for a short period of time um knowing that that was going to change so then um sinclair broadcast group is a company that owns tv stations across the country and um that was their bread and butter a completely different world from regional sports television but they saw the value in it Uh, there was a high valuation on regional sports television 
and the RSNs. Um, the RSNs were making a lot of money just as an entity themselves. I think the RSNs had a valuation of about $10.8 billion. Um, Sinclair Broadcast Group, I think, had a valuation of about $4 billion. So you have an example here of a smaller company buying a bigger company. But the reason they did that was they, they saw the value that that could bring to their company, raise their profile and their portfolio, and make Sinclair Broadcast Group as a whole more profitable. Um, it was going to take several years for Sinclair Broadcast Group to become more profitable because they had to borrow money to buy the regional sports networks and they were going to go into debt to do that and they were going to have yeah. to pay that money back. So um, all of that went down um, whatever year that was. <laughs> and um, 20, I think 2019 tw probably. 2019 I think it was, yeah. And um, during all of this time, you know, changing a brand of a network is a very difficult thing to do. It's not something you do overnight. And so um, Sinclair buys the network. Um, even during the time Disney owned it, though, in all of this transitionary time, it was still branded as Fox Sports Regional Networks. So Sp Fox Sports Southwest, Fox Sports New Orleans, Fox Sports Oklahoma, Fox Sports Southeast, all of these different things. So that, that was what, the, what it was still branded as. Even after Sinclair brought, bought it, the deal was made that it would stay branded as a Fox Sports entity, just from a branding standpoint. And mm -hmm. I think that that contract was for 18 months. And then once you got to the end of that 18 months, the branding would stop and a new branding would start. That would give the network time to name the network, put the branding behind the network and, and start it all up. So, and, and, and get the new branding going. So all of that kind of took place. You know, a lot of people were like, well, I don't understand. Why would it take that long? Just call it the Sinclair Sports Network and go on with life. Well, there's no sex appeal to the Sinclair Sports Network. <laughs> so it was like, no, we're not going to do it that way. So, so what we ended up with was... Um, a long process of a lot of executives in an office figuring out, okay, what are we going to call the network? Then, and in the meantime, the entity Diamond Sports had been created to be the entity under Sinclair Broadcast Group that would run the regional sports networks. So new executives are hired at Diamond Sports from other parts of the sports world, and um, they're basically getting everything set for the transition to be to be made um on the uh to the uh new branding and um they uh, ended up coming up with a naming rights deal they had all these nice names for the network but then someone said you know what we we, we should do a naming rights and they got bally sports involved or bally involved the company bally involved uh from the naming rights standpoint so you know how they have naming rights for arenas, the American Airlines Center, the SoFi Center, right. the whatever you call it, you know, any number of names, AT&T Center or AT&T Stadium. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think that had ever been done with a sports network, but they made that happen. And so a lot of people think that you and I worked for Bally, but we <laughs> didn't work for Bally. We worked for right. Sinclair Broadcast Group or for Diamond Sports under the umbrella of Sin Sinclair Broadcast Group. Um, my first email, once it changed, was sbgtv.com, Sinclair, mm -hmm. Sinclair Broadcast Group Television.com. That's, that's what that stood yeah. for. So that was the umbrella that we were operating under. Bally was just simply a name of a company that bought the rights to name the network. And... Um, Part of the reason they wanted to go with Bally is Bally has a sizable sports book and sports gambling is now coming into play. And so I knew that there was kind of part of that play with, you know, making that relationship and, and having the sports betting part of it, you know, be a, a, an eventual part of, of everything that was going to happen. And um, so, yeah, things were rolling along, the branding changed and everything. Then COVID hit and sports went away. 
and uh, dominoes started falling and, and that changed everything. Yeah. Uh, just the, I think looking at the way that fans in, in this market react to what Bally sports is now, they mm-hmm. reminisce of the times of Fox sports. There are some who know the transition, who are aware that they're the same entity. There are some right. who don't know at all that they're the same entity and that it was, it was just handed off and somehow like all of Bally's decisions upended all of Fox decisions. And it, so there's, there's, there's a bit of confusion in the market just because of that transition. Definitely. But, you know, there's, we're, we're well on, we're about to be on our way to another transition, <laughs> but yes, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's another, another conversation for another time, considering that it hasn't, hasn't been, and, re- and I don't have any inside yet. information on that one because I'm not there anymore. But, um, I, I, uh, was talking to some people shortly after I left Valley sports and seeing every all of the bankruptcy stuff coming and and what was going on and i remember in a conversation i mentioned to someone amazon and now here we are <laughs> this yeah that was, was um pathetic. that was some <laughs> i'll tell you what uh, you and i were on the same wavelength there uh, cuz we we had we had a meeting in the summer after the right the summer right after the bankruptcy was was filed and one of the it, it was Jason Walsh who was running that meeting and one of the questions that I had asked him was this would there be a potential move toward a tech company such as Apple who has already made partnerships with MLS and MLB or Amazon who's already started with the NFL and Thursday night football, considering they don't have an ESPN Mm -hmm. property. They don't have a national network property that's running 24 seven. So they wouldn't get hit with the same thing Disney did. And because they were a tech company, they could deficit spend to no end uh, up until the point that RSNs would become, so would possibly become profitable again, or they could transition it to streaming so that they could keep up with the technology of today. Um, it, It was it was, I guess, I didn't say all that, but I'm sure that with the way that I presented the question, he understood why I was at, why I was asking it that way. Um, and at the time, he he did he did mention that he isn't sure of like what conversations are happening, but he wouldn't be he wouldn't have been surprised if that was the direction that the company went. And then, not even nine months later, we find out about the Amazon investment. So it, like it's it, it's kind of like the if you pay attention to the market dynamics of broadcasting and, and how streaming is starting to take over, who are the players and who are their competitors? Do they, or do they want to be left out? The answer is most likely no. Then you, you kind of know who's going to eventually enter the space and be familiarized with how it's all going to end up, uh, you know, evolving. So, you know, we, we, I think we were on, I think we were on to something. <laughs> you and I, you and I are onto something. I'm not well, afraid to pat know, myself just, and Andy on the back on that one. Well, a, a part of it too is that I mean, we kind of got tipped off because you know we were starting to see Amazon dip their toe in the water in the sports space, and then you know, you know, now they're doing Thursday night football exclusively, which is a huge deal. So, uh, but we were already kind of starting to see it. So I don't know. I just had this inkling that that they were really this this was going to be right up their alley. Yeah. Um, the, throughout your last, I think it's been, I think you said it's been nine years now, uh, or at least you didn't say it in this interview, but you've said it to us in another setting where just like Jason Walsh has used the studio to be the farm for the truck, you have found a way to go back to our alma mater and create a class that you know in the long term could potentially farm students into the broadcast uh into the sports broadcasting industry or broadcasting as a whole 
And I am a product of that. And so I do want to, I do want to ask you, how did that class come about? I know the answer, but the audience won't know the answer, but how did that class come about? How were your first few years in constructing that class? And how have you changed your syllabus as the years have gone on and as the technology has gotten, has evolved even more and how you've seen the results of the early years of this class? Okay. I'll, I'll start answering. And if I somehow don't answer every part of the question, keep me honest and bring me back to it. But um, the way the class started was um, I had gone, so it was, it was not long. Um, let me think about the timing of this. No, it was, it was a later iteration of this because we did that 3D game in 2008. I came and spoke to one of Corey Carbonara's classes, one of our former professors, um, about the 3D broadcast, but then it was, it was a few years later. Anyway, I'd come back to speak uh, to a couple of classes at Baylor. And, um, and um, before one of the classes, me, Corey, Dr. Corpy, and Brian Elliott all went to lunch. And we were all sitting there at lunch and we were talking about, you know, kind of reminiscing back to some of my early days at Baylor, which is about the time uh, Dr. Carbonara and uh, Dr. Corpy arrived at Baylor. I was, I was like a freshman when they got there. So um, we all kind of came to Baylor at the same time together, uh, me as a student, them as professors. And then Brian Elliott's like closer to my age, and we worked together at KWTX for a while before he became a professor. So we're all just sitting there talking, and um, they were talking about how really, you know, when, when I was there, there was a campus radio station, and there was this little broadcast studio. And uh, they were doing some broadcasting type things. And I think at one point after I'd left Baylor, um, the local PBS station for Waco was being housed out of the KWBU studios uh, there at Castellaw Communications Building. And so there was a broadcasting arm to the program. Uh, but as film and digital media kind of evolved it, when it, when it didn't really become radio TV film and kind of evolved into film and digital media, um, and, and, and Frank Fallon was the voice of Baylor at the time, and he was one of the pro professors there also, uh, kind of in the mix, um, and he was kind of keeping the broadcast part of the program alive. Well, when he, he retired and then subsequently passed away, um, that part of the program, they never really had anybody that was strong in that. And so um, the guys were at, lunch, at that lunch, they were just talking about how, you know what, we're, we're really, we've just become a film school, not a broadcast school. And uh, just about all of the professors here, our knowledge is in the film side of the business, not the broadcast side of the business. And so, you know, we were just talking about that. And, and uh, I remember as I thought about that, I, I circled back to them and I said, you know, we were talking about this um, thing about, you know, there's, there's not as much a broadcast emphasis. And they were lamenting that, by the way, because they have several students that were interested in the broadcast side of the business, but, you know, it wasn't necessarily really being offered there anymore uh, like it was when I was in college there at Baylor. So um, I, just, I just said, well, you know, um, what about the possibility of me coming down and teaching as an adjunct professor a, a class, you know? And, and, you know, let's dip our toe in the water with that and just see how it goes and then and, and see if uh, maybe that can bring a little broadcast emphasis back into the program. And so um, at that time, Chris Hansen had become the uh, department head. And so they put me in touch with Chris. Me, Brian Elliott, and Chris had a meeting. And uh, we kind of talked through different things, what the class might look like, you know, and at that time I didn't even know for sure what it would look like, but um, I had just kind of some ideas in my head, so we kind of talked through that. And uh, ultimately, um, we, we met, talked through it, and, um, and then Chris said, well, get, get back with me with a, a proposed syllabus a proposed structure of the class and all of those things. And, and then um, I'll start the process and see if we can actually get it with the registrar and, and get it to be an actual class uh, that people sign up for. So um, I think that we had that meeting either in late 2014 or early 2015. Uh, the class launched in the spring of 2016. And so there was a whole year process 
of planning before it even actually became something that was a class that, that students could sign up for. And so um, that first year, uh, we decided it would only be in the spring semesters, uh, part, partly because I needed it to be that way. Um, the way my job was um, uh, at the time, uh, with the NBA starting, you know, right there in November, there was just such a hectic time. The, the, the fall is always busier with football and the start of NBA, the start of NHL. There's just, there's just so much going on. So it was going to be uh, much better for me to start it in the spring. Um, and it was going to be better for the university, too. They, they said, yeah, we, a lot of these classes we only do one semester. Having it just in the spring is perfect. So um, we, we kind of made that decision. And so there we go. We, we put it in line, and, um, and it started in the spring of 2016. Um, with I think 18 students that first uh, that first year, um, and so um, it was it was a great success. And each year, Chris would go, "Okay, you going to do this next year? Yeah, I'm game. Okay, let's do it next year." And and it's just become one thing after another. And and so um, backing up a little bit uh, and putting some structure behind the class. Um, I really had to give that a lot of thought, but um, I, I decided, you know, what's the mission statement of this class? Well, the mission statement of this class is to um, give students just an inkling, an idea of what they're walking into if they go into this business and, um, and be able to hear it from some real world um, people <laughs> that are in the business. Me being one of them at the time, I was a professor, but I wanted to bring other people in. I wanted to bring people from all facets of the business, on-air talent, producers, directors, um, salespeople, you know, people from every part of the business I wanted to bring in and uh, have them share their insights. And so um, I had been tapped to um, speak at a similar class, kind of a sports broadcasting class that was taught by an adjunct at University of North Texas. And um, I saw the way his class was structured, and his class was like all guest speakers. And um, they, the class time was guest speakers, and then the rest of the time, these people worked on North Texas television. And that was, that was, you know, another part of their class that they were doing, but everything was guest speakers, and they had to write papers on the guest speakers. So I'm like, okay, so... This is a three-hour class. I think what I'll do is make half of the class be guest speakers, and then the other ha half of the class I'll have a topic that we'll talk about and lecture on or whatever. And so um, in, I, I kind of looked at all of the different facets of the business, and I, I picked five major ones. <laughs> and, um, you know, I kind of picked um, um, production or operations first. You've got to start with operations. So operations, production, on-air talent, sales, and marketing. So those were my five areas, and that was the structure uh, of the class. And then I kind of added another little piece to it, uh, which is like the business foundation. And I decided, you know what? It really starts before, you know, what happens before you can even get to production? Uh, well, you have to have rights deals, and there has to be carriage deals. There's all this executive stuff in the executive suite that has to happen, all these agreements that have to be made, lawyers have to sign papers, all of this stuff has to happen before you can even get to that. So the first two classes, we talk about that, and then we get into all these other aspects of it. So that was really the framework of the syllabus. And, um, and then I would bring in the guest speakers, and then we would talk about those different topics. Um, over the years, um, the structure has not changed. Um, the syllabus itself has not really changed. Um, I've, I've made a few little adjustments in the way I do certain things, but uh, that's not changed. What has changed is the content within each area. So what I talk about in op what I talked about in operations nine years ago is a little bit different than what I talk about in operations now because of the changes that have been made. Some of the things we talk about in production are different now than than what I talked about nine years ago. So I, I always try to keep it fresh with you know what's going on right now, and um, and so it's the content within those areas that 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 do change. Uh, one thing that I did make a change on, and I can't remember. I think your class did. Like when I had you critique a broadcast, did I just have you guys critique the Super Bowl? We did. We did um, a Super Bowl critique. That was that was one um, 
critique that we did. And then I think we did another one of our choice from a certain time frame. And so I, okay. I picked the basketball game. Okay. I just remember when I started the class every year, I, I had a framework for a critique. You know, I had it broken into critique the presentation, you know, things like how the announcers look, how the broadcast looks, you know, how is it presented, uh, critique the on-air talent, critique the content, the storylines, you know, is it a well-told story, uh, critique how the sales elements are and promotional elements are, are put in there. So I had this framework for that. And then I would just have each student individually write up a critique on the Super Bowl with those criteria. And I think it was maybe the year, no, it was, I think it was two years after your class. Um, I decided to turn that into a group project. And so now I divide the class, depending on how many are in the class, but like this year I've got 20 students. So it's four groups of five. And so each group is going to critique the same broadcast. And it's no longer just the Super Bowl that actually was being played that year, like what you guys did. I find a broadcast that's already been done. I pick it. I send the link to that broadcast, and then the students have it. And then different students make a presentation about that part of the broadcast. And I decided to do it that way because I, I thought, you know, this is an industry that requires a lot of teamwork. And so I wanted, you know, the, the people in the class to get used to working in teams and, and working together and each one having their own role. So, and I'd also seen the uh, sports strategy and sales program, the S3 program in the business school at Baylor uh, mm -hmm. do group presentations. Um, and I saw the way that they did those because I had to go judge them one year. And so um, I was like, I kind of like the way they're doing this. And so I, I incorporated that into the class. So that was one change that I made over the years. But uh, yeah, I'm tweaking and adjusting little things as we go along, but it's mostly has to do with content. Um, but the, the structure is really kind of the same. Um, we, we talk about the same things. Uh, one of the things that's gotten added into production, and I've really kind of created it as its own little category over here, is uh, social and digital. And so we've started talking oh, yeah. a lot more about social and digital uh, over about the last, you know, five years or so uh, in the class. So, um, you know, it is nine years, but I think this is the eighth class out of the nine years. We skipped 2021 because of COVID. So um, we were in the middle of the semester when COVID hit, and I had to finish that semester with remote learning, uh, which worked out fine. We were able to get it done. But then um, 2021, they did away with all adjunct classes, and, uh, you know, everything was streamlined for, for that year with COVID. And then uh, we came back in 2022, and off we go. So uh, that's been it. It's been one of the most gratifying parts of my career because, you know, someone asked me one time when I was speaking to a group, what's been the most gratifying part of your career? What are you most proud of? And I said, I'm most proud when I see either a former intern or student or young person that I've been able to influence go on to have success in this business. That's that's my favorite thing about the business. And so and it still is. And so, you know, I get a thrill out of teaching the class because um, it helps guys like you get into the business. So whenever you have me, uh, whenever you have me back, you've had me back twice now. Um, yep. you, you pair me up with Matt Johnston, who's with the Dallas Mavericks. Mm -hmm. uh, there there have been others who who I've gotten to meet, such as uh, Alicia Haynes, who is one yep. of our operations coordinators operations people and, now. Yeah. Yeah. and uh casey culbertson has come through as uh as, she's done multiple roles but um she's been on oh the, awesome uh, she's she's been on the ballet bar and then she's been on on the viz and learned from time to time so whenever she's in town like she'll she'll get a shift or two and come through and then football season is a little more busy so uh we've i've seen the fruits of your labor come through yeah. to come through the halls in a way where more people are starting to notice, Oh, we're getting more, more Baylor people. Oh, they're, they're, they're Dave's students. Okay. That's cool. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> so, you know, that's, it, that's it. We're, we're getting there. We're, we're kicking down. We're, we're kicking away the doors of, I would say we're kicking yeah. away the doors of TCU, but there's still a lot of them coming through. So. Yeah, there are a lot of them, you know, <laughs> TCU's got a whole major in the program 
And so that puts yeah. them at a, there's two things that put TCU at a little bit of an advantage. One is they've got a entire major that's called sports broadcasting and, and that attracts a lot of people. But a, a, number two, um, they, they did a really smart thing. They years ago consulted with uh, the people at Fox to build out their control room and their facilities there. And so they're using EBS, they're using, you know, um, the Cayenne switcher, they're using a lot of the same technology that's in the television trucks in their studios. And so those kids are coming out already knowing how to use a lot of the equipment, but being able to yeah. use the equipment, that's, that's a learning curve that anybody can catch up on. So, you know, I, I have, uh, if they were ever to want me to, uh, I could I could completely restructure their program and uh, make it better. I'll just I'll leave it. At that. Yeah. Every, everybody out there, everybody out there that's listening, take him up on his offer. Yeah. Um, okay. There's only a, only a couple of questions left. Um, hey. One of them, I I think I I've when when I first came into the building. One of the things that stuck with me that you said early on, especially because you know the uh, the slight the the little background I'll give is that mentally I I just come from a place where all I had was uncertainty, and all I wanted was job security, disregarding the fact that the entire broadcast industry is freelance. Uh, but the number one thing that stuck with me was when you said the best thing to do is to be available. And when you were teaching the class, of course you had talked about not burning your bridges because everybody knows everybody. That's kind of like whenever you talk to people within the industry, that's what you start to notice that you've got lots of people who know a lot of the same people. And if you burn one bridge, you don't know that you've probably burned 10 bridges, but when it came to how am I going to get from where I am, which is I just need work, to a place of, I guess, I wouldn't say prosperity, but at least some sort of belonging, that I'm doing good work and then I can stay in this business a long time if I just continue to do that. So being available was probably the number one thing that I took from what you told me in your office. And from that point on, it came to not only meeting with the crews that you had introduced me to, but also taking the moment out to you know, bump into people who may have been a guest speaker, such as Hall of Famer Nancy Lieberman, who was one of our last guest speakers um, during that semester that you taught me. She was sitting in someone's cubicle in the newsroom while waiting for Thunder Live to kind of get back into, into the swing of things. And there was about maybe six days before I was going to see you again. And I was, I just said to myself, I'm, I'm not going to wait for Dave. Nancy's right here. If I just mention that I'm Dave's student, uh, that I was Dave's student, then she'll know exactly the premise. And I'll, I'll just, I'll say like say this is this is my name just so you can remember my face and then the next time I'm in maybe we'll see each other again and then then and then she literally said would you like to uh, come through in the next show on Monday I think it was uh, probably I, I forget what day it was that I actually talked to her but whatever the next show was she said mm -hmm. come on by so I said all right and then that's how I met the Thunder Crew and then that just snowballed in a way where eventually I started learning the graphics machine and showed up every day to a point where I, and I've, I've told you this before and your class as well, but I, it got to a point where somebody in the building knew I was coming back before I left. And that was my way of making sure that I stayed available. Right. And then that just led to the first six months, first six or seven months of just operating and learning the machine while also being right next to the person, the graphics associate producer who, you know, eventually I wanted to get to that role because one of the other things that you had mentioned was when you're available and you show that you're going to be there all the time, 
and that you are dependable, they will give you that kind of a that kind of a promotion. So eventually it turned into that where I learned how the person the, the job that I wanted, I learned from the people who were there. And it was they were patient with me, they were gracious with their time, and I couldn't have been I can't be where I am now without all of those people. And eventually led to the opportunity of a lifetime, which I never thought was possible. I mean, I, there, I knew that it was a possibility. I just didn't know that all the cards would line up in that way where I got to build graphics for our studio show for my hometown team that I grew up watching since 2003, right? There, there's, there's no, there, there's no story on planet earth that, that, you know, someone could put in their minds of like, Oh yeah, that's just, that can just happen. Like there's so many things that have to go right for that to happen. And it, it all comes all the way back to the advice that you gave me. All of that to say, what advice would you have for someone who's just starting out in this industry, someone who would, who would be a student of yours or someone who's pretty early on in their careers and they're not really sure how to navigate the early strenuous times of the business where they're trying to learn everything and want to eventually get to a higher place uh, so that they can make more of an impact in this, in this business. Okay. Well, first I'll say, um, be patient with yourself. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, it can happen more quickly than you think, like it kind of did for you. And in, in the situation from the time that you came into my office to where you are now really wasn't all that long ago. But um, just understand that it, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, also, um, come to the realization that the decisions you make now will determine your direction for the future. And so you made a decision to come into my office to give me a call when you were kind of at a place where you were uh, flailing, for lack of a better term, and uh, kind of going, okay, what, what's my future here? And, um, and you gave me a call. You used the contact that you had made with me and you gave me a call. That set into motion several things, but it, it started with that decision. And so it all starts with a, a very intentional decision. And so just understand that it's what you do now is not insignificant. It can lead to a lot of other things. Um, if I had not made a decision to follow my wife's advice and send that resume to the Dallas Mavericks, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. I wouldn't be teaching a class at Baylor. I never would have had this career. And so that one decision set my entire life on a trajectory that I never could have imagined. And so, um, just understand how important your decisions are, you know, and, and, um, you're not always going to make the right decision, but making a decision is always very important and, and pursue it. Uh, the decision you make needs to be in line with what you're passionate about. If you know, man, I would love to go this direction then make decisions that will lead you in that direction. When you turn your steering wheel to the right, it's not going to take you to the left. It's not a mistake. <laughs> and so it's, it's not random. So make decisions that are taking you in the direction generally where you want to go. You don't know what the road looks like ahead, uh, but at least you're going in that direction so that you can find out um, where, where it's going to take you. And then all of that comes to you. All of that comes to you. So um, you just got to kind of let that happen. Um, so, yeah, that's that's probably my biggest thing right there is, you know, <laughs> I, I told you I had all those people at my first job saying, this is for the birds. They're not paying us enough. We should go work at McDonald's, whatever. And I finally told the guy, go work at McDonald's, you know, and, and, and all of that. What if I had listened to them? What if I had jumped on board with them? And what if I'd said, yeah, you're right. This is for the birds. They're not paying me enough right now. I, I never would have learned all the stuff I learned, put the resume together that made it the perfect resume for the Mavericks and then sent, sent my uh, career uh, path on a completely different tra trajectory. So um, be real intentional with your decisions and um, follow your heart, follow your dreams, 
Um, your dreams aren't always going to come true. But what can happen is let the journey come to you, go in the right direction, and then let that journey come to you. I wanted to be a sportscaster. I wanted to be on air. I wanted to do play-by-play. -play. I'm not doing play-by-play. -play. Does that mean I failed? Would you think I failed? No. I hire those guys now. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's... I didn't become one, but I hire them. So, I mean... Who would have head, thought, right? Who would have thought, you know? And so... Um, and, and, and be prepared for, uh, to have an alternate passion because like I said, I wanted to do on air stuff, but I became passionate about the producing side of the business. I became passionate about, um, all of the production aspects of putting a broadcast together and the creative creativity that goes into that. And so that, um, you know, I think it was that, um, wanting to pursue on air work that caused me to stumble on the creativity of the production side of it. And I've never looked back. So the, uh, the second to last question I have for you okay. is about your eventual retirement. Okay. Since in, since I had first come in, in 2022, then I believe it was only two months later at that point you had made, you had uh, found yourself at a transitioning point in your life and mm -hmm. decided to walk away. So how did that, how did that decision come about? Are you at peace with that decision and what do you do now? Okay. Um, that decision came about um, very, trying to look for the word. Um, it was not expected. I was not looking. I was not sending out resumes. I wasn't like going, you know what, I'm getting tired of what I'm doing. I want to do something else or whatever. I, I, I was thinking about retirement because uh, I'll be 60 in June. And, um, you know, that's an early retirement, I guess you could say. But um, I, uh, I was already kind of thinking, okay, in the next few years, as I wind this career down, what's that going to look like? Um, but I did, I did see some things happening that were coming with, you know, all the talk of the bankruptcy uh, that was happening at Valley Sports. And, and I just saw some, some, some signs there that um, were leading me to start thinking about the next chapter and maybe what I, what I might want to do with um, what I call the second half of my career. I always said, I'm, I don't think I'm ever really going to retire and like go fishing or golfing or whatever. <laughs> um, I'm just going to start a new venture and, uh, and, and probably better phrased a new adventure. And so, um, you know, I was just kind of like, okay, well, what am I going to do with the second half of my life? Which, um, if I'm 60 years old and, now coming up here in June, that means I plan to live to be 120. Um, so, uh, as I start on this journey of the second half of life, but, but, um, no, I was just starting to think about what that next chapter was going to look like. I was kind of seeing some changes in our industry. Uh, I was kind of wondering how I fit into those changes and, and how that might take place. But I had a job. I was doing the job. I was enjoying the job for the most part. Um, I had concerns about the future, but um, I was I was going along. And um, out of the blue, uh, there's there's a church here in Allen, Texas that I've attended for 26 years. Me and my family, and the executive pastor of that church has been there that entire time. He's a friend of mine. He's someone that I've known, and uh, he called me up one day. Um, in uh, February of 2022, and he said, hey, I'd like to uh, go have coffee with you. I was like, okay. Well, I was a trustee at the church, and so I thought he had trustee business he was needing to talk to me about. Um, our church had built this control room that I'm sitting in right now, and so I thought maybe he had questions about that or whatever. And uh, so we met and met for coffee, and uh, uh, I didn't realize it, but he, uh, before we finished our conversation, he offered me a job. 
<laughs> and I was like, whoa, that, that kind of took me aback. I wasn't really expecting that. But um, the church was going through a major transition uh, with, uh, you know, we, we had come out of COVID. COVID changed everything for houses of worship and churches. I mean, because they shut down like everything else. A lot of them, people weren't coming. And so most people were watching online. And so camera technology, streaming technology, all of the things that we do in the broadcast world were coming to the forefront. And so um, this particular church had had already made a lot of capital expenditure purchases to, you know, really build up, you know, um, the infrastructure and everything uh, from a broadcast standpoint. And so um, he just said, you know, we've, we've kind of gotten beyond what anybody here really knows. But he said, you're a broadcast veteran and, and I need some kind of a broadcast veteran to come in here and like kind of help run this, this area. So, man, I was not expecting it. I certainly didn't give him an answer right then. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to have to think, think about this for a little while. And so um, I didn't have a long, long time to think about it, but I thought about it for, you know, a week, week and a half. And then I'd gotten to a point where... Um, I was about 80% sure I was not going to take the position because it was just too different. I worked my entire career in sports. I've gone to this church for 26 years, but working for it and going to it are two different things. And so I was like, I, I just don't know. I don't know if it's going to be the right fit. So I was starting to kind of lean in that direction. And um, in the meantime, I had this docu-series project I'd been working on. And um, that's a whole nother story. But um, I remember I was thinking as I was talking, thinking kind of through all of this retirement process and what that might look like. I was like, well, man, what could I do that would give me more time to work on my docuseries and, and do some of those things? Because that was a passion project. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting there kind of thinking and praying about that in one hand. And in the other hand, I've got this job offer that I'm about to say no to. And, uh, and, and one night it, it just hit me and it was, it was God knocking on my head going, Hey, stupid, that prayer you've been praying about your docuseries, this is part of the answer. I brought this to you. So what are you going to do with it? And so at that point I realized, you know what? I think that's right. The time, the time is right for me to make kind of a, a smooth exit out of the sports world and, uh, start you know, I'll, I'll go to work for the church, help build some things here. And, and we built a whole entity here called Creek Media uh, that I'm the executive producer of. And um, I run production and communications here. And um, it, it's, it's, it's been a, a wonderful thing, but it's, it's also given me time to work on the docuseries a little bit more. So, um, um, so yeah, everything has kind of come together. Um, do I miss what I was doing? Not so much some, but not terribly. I, I really miss the people. Uh, the people were, were family. They were more, you know, they, <laughs> I took, I took the class to the field trip to the Mavericks game last Thursday. And, um, my class was noticing how everyone that I ran into was coming up, hugging me and everything. And, you know, <laughs> and I said, you guys just have to understand, you have to understand that these people, I saw them more than my own family for, you know, almost 30 years. So, you know, you kind of have to understand that that's um, the dynamic that we have going here. So I do miss the people, but um, I'm very happy where I'm at right now. I think it was the right decision. Um, the pace is more fitting uh, to what I need at this time of my life right now. And um, it, it's just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in a different part of life and, and I'm really enjoying it. And the sports broadcasting class and staying connected to all the people is what kind of keeps me in the sports world a little bit. And so, you know, I'm kind of getting a little bit of the best of both worlds right now and I'm loving it. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm happy for you and I'm, I'm glad that you've found your next step and thank you. Know, you. There's, there's a, uh, it's a good way to retire. A lot of, yeah. A lot, a lot of, a lot of people don't get this kind of chance to transition that quickly and right. into, into the things that, they can find purpose in, uh, right. the speaking of speaking of finding purpose, the last question that I, that I'm going to ask you is 
the question that I, that from every interview on, um, I'm going to ask everybody, and this will you know most of the guests will will probably be comprised of people within the television industry, and so right. those of us in television, I would like you to tell your vision as to what you would like to see from the broadcast industry, the vision that you have for uh, the projects that you're doing, including your class, what you what you want to see come out of all of these different things, what you want to, what you want to see kind of take over in the next 10, 20 years. Hmm. I'm going to have to, now I'm going to, I'm, I'm the one who's going to have to stop and think about this for a little bit. There's a lot in, in that question. Oh man. Um, I, th I think one of the things that I'm seeing is um, the work ethics changing a little bit. We're in a more instant society. Um, we're in a society where people have way more options in viewing than I had when I was your age, you know, I mean, Netflix, Hulu, all of the different offerings there, you know, just the way you access your content is way different. Um, and, and I love that actually. I, you know, I, I love the a la carte method of consuming content. You know, I can, I can just watch whatever I want, whenever I want it really. And so, um, so I absolutely love that aspect of, of, of what's going on. But, but what I'm seeing is um, I, I'm seeing a lot of young people come into the business who um, are wanting everything that I worked 30 years from for, they want it right now. And so what I want to see is a group of young people, and that's what I'm trying to instill in this class, is a group of young people that understands that it's a marathon, not a sprint. And that understands there's a reason it's a marathon, not a sprint. Because if I had been elevated to the position of director of broadcasting of the Dallas Mavericks, even 10 years after I'd been out of college, I wouldn't have had enough ex life experience to make the decisions that I was going to be required to make. Everything that you do in the stepping stones of your career is preparing you for the next step, the next step, the next step, and ultimately that big thing that you do. And so, you know, it's kind of like going back to the story in the Bible of David and Goliath. Um, David didn't just walk in one day and pick up a stone and throw it and hit Goliath. He was a lowly shepherd boy. Well, he had to he had to fight lions, and he had to fight bears, and he had to protect his sheep by doing all of these things, and and he had to become a really good marksman <laughs> to take them down. And so, all of those years being bored, what seemingly was insignificant work as a shepherd boy, actually prepared him to defeat Goliath. And so every little seemingly insignificant thing you do early in, in your career has meaning and it is preparing you for that big moment. And so what I want to see in the industry is, is more young people coming out with that mindset and that understanding. On the flip side of that, I want to see more old fogies like me being willing to learn from the young people like you. Because these young people coming up are coming up with a completely different perspective and mindset, but also a completely different under, understanding of today's technology, a better understanding of today's technology. And so, like I said, the technology changes fast. Everybody in the industry has to stay relevant by staying up with the technology. Well, it goes both ways. Young people need to learn from the experience of the older people. The older people need to learn from the knowledge of the younger people. And it needs to do this, you know? 
and uh, and I'm seeing that. I'm seeing a lot of that happening. And and um, to me, it that's kind of the foundation for the ultimate health of the industry. Because as long as you have that kind of symbiotic relationship going on, I think the industry is going to benefit from it and it's going to become a better, stronger industry with a lot wiser decisions being made uh, that will be carried over into the future and it will better prepare your generation as you get closer to my age to prepare that next generation to come in and do the same thing. Um, so, you know, I just want longevity, a, a very healthy longevity uh, for the industry in whatever direction it goes. But it ain't going away. The industry's here. And so, um, is it going to be a good, healthy industry, or is it going to, that, that does some really cool, creative things and continues to progress forward, or is it going to stagnate, you know? Uh, and I think a lot of the key in that is, is uh, how the next generation comes into the business and how the older generation reacts to that. Dave, thanks again for coming on. I really Absolutely. appreciate you giving your time. It, oh, it's, for been, sure. it's been fun having you. I don't, I don't remember the last time we spent this much time together since, since I it's, took your class. So the, this yeah, is awesome. it's been a while. So. All right. Thank you everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming in. Thanks for watching this episode, listening to this episode. You can find Dave, you are the former coordinating producer of Fox sports, Southwest, New Orleans, Oklahoma, and Valley sports, Southwest. So, um, New Orleans and Oklahoma, you are now, uh, one more time, your title, please. I am the executive director of Creek Media, which is the production and communications entity at Cottonwood Creek Church in Allen. And if you know this man and you are friends with this man and you'd like more information on anything sports broadcasting, you can always reach out to him. All right. He's, he's the reason I'm here. I couldn't be where I am today without him. So just please, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, he's, in your, if he's in your shot, take the wisdom from this man. Thanks again, David. It's been really great having you on. Thank you, Ezreal. Thank you, Ezreal.